our sponsors. This is Tanoa Lynn Poyer, and I want to welcome you to Community Conversations on WNN 95.3 FM and 1470 AM. This show is about you. I want to hear your trials and triumphs, challenges and victories, and how you overcome obstacles every day in our dynamic industry. All callers are welcome to join Community Conversations. This is where we'll discuss all things in common. We'll discuss managers, directors, vendors, and owners. Let's elevate the conversation. Raise the bar. Start here, now. Welcome. Let's raise the bar. And happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the privilege of being able to spend a little time with you at the end of a long week. And if no one has said to you, Thank you for all you do, all of you board members who serve tirelessly, all of you community managers and support staff who um, are ears and eyes and arms sometimes. I, we personally experienced in our community a, a big loss of somebody that we loved very much. And so my heart is with all of you, uh, if you're listening. And I just want to say thank you because you make a big impact in a really important industry. and. Today, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about kind of the property manager or community manager's pet peeves. I'm sure owners have their own pet peeves, and I would be interested in hearing those if you wish to call. And if you want to join in, it is 888-565-1470, 888-565-1470. And then I'm going to give you a few statistics on the industry, because I'm not sure uh, everyone who does not live in a community association understands how big this is, what an impact managers and support staff and board members and vendors make on the industry. So um, if, just bear with me. It won't be too boring, but it is really important. You're going to have me for the entire half hour. I want you to get to know me before we invite guests onto the program. I want you to understand my passion for this business. <clears throat> Pardon me. It is not the most sexy industry in the world, but it is a place where we can make a real impact for people. So, as I said last week, the industry is about people. We make rules that govern the behavior of people. We make sure that the association is um, healthy and safe for people. We want to uh, make the place beautiful and comfortable. We want to improve curb appeal and make sure the pool is sparkling and wonderful, make sure that um, it, the area is clean and safe from hazards for people. So I want everyone involved in the industry to remind themselves that this really is just about people. It's not process, it's not profits, it's not payables, it's people. Okay, so let's start there. And then we're gonna color outside the lines a little bit. None of what I'm going to suggest is necessarily feasible but I want us to start thinking outside, oh, I almost said outside the box, outside of the lines um, about how we can get people engaged in their community now. There's apathy about involvement all over the country, but we're not doing that here. We're gonna have a conversation about how we get people involved in board meetings, how we encourage them to read their documents, and how we encourage them to uh, read and respond to communication devices that uh, association managers really work hard on providing so that we can warn people with enough time for things that are coming up. Notices about uh, construction, changes, um, uh, emergencies that uh, perhaps you need to avoid in the future, planning for a big event that's going to change the way you enter and exit the community, all of those things. We're going to talk about how we get people to respond. I want to start by giving you some statistics. So bear with me because I have to uh, read. This is for a radio audience that is also being played uh, on uh, Facebook at AMP2TV. If you want to watch this live, it's AMP squared or AMP2TV on Facebook. You'll be able to find me there. So this data has been gathered from a company called I guess it's a, an organizational um, industry uh, organization called Community Association Institute. 
They've been around since the early 70s, I believe, and they're the repository for lots of data for community associations. It's also a place where they strive for excellence with training, conferences, classes, statistics, credentialing. Uh, there's something called a professional uh, CAM, a professional community association manager. That is a hard-earned designation, and that is a person who has achieved the highest level of excellence in the community. That process happens through CAI. So CAI tells us that 21.3% of the people in the country, of the population, live in a community association. Florida leads the nation in community associations. I think second is California, followed by Texas and um, we'll post this online for you to see later. Florida leads the nations, and we're kind of the, at the tip of the spear, if you will, in this industry. So imagine this, that 47% of the population in Florida lives in a community association. So that's, let's just call it half rounded. So one of every two people is impacted by a community association. In California, I think it's around 23%, and in Texas, uh, I want to say 14%. 14% is still a significant amount of uh, people impacted by community association laws, regulations. Um, I will tell you that they, uh, this, just, just, um, sorry, English this time, statistics tell us that 90% of the people that live in community associations are happy, have a positive view, or a neutral view. I think it does, is 64% of the people who live there has a, have a positive view of community associations, and 26% or so have a neutral um, perspective. Here's a really great statistic. 88% of the people who have interaction with their community association manager report a positive experience. Woohoo! That, that makes my heart sing. That's really good. That means that we have kind of a benchmark and that we can be more excellent. And let's try to figure out how to do that together. One statistic that really stood out for me is this one. $1.93 billion is what it would cost if all of the people in associations who volunteered, that's committee members, board members, either standing uh, committee members, ad hoc, all of the volunteers, that is the value of their contribution, $1.93 billion. That is significant. So to all of you board members who are out there listening, thank you. We can't do it without you. Thank you par for partnering with us. Thank you for trusting us with your valuable assets. Thank you for co-laboring with us to uh, make all your communities better. It really, when it works well, it's a beautiful thing. I think you might agree with that. The last statistic I'm going to give you, because I, uh, I feel like I might be losing the room here, is that if you combine all of the real estate assets in community associations, it is $5.5 trillion. That is an enormous number if you were to write that out. That means that community association boards, managers, and staff are responsible for multi-trillion dollars in assets. The maintenance of those assets, the preservation of those assets, the look of them, the uh, transfer uh, that happens within those uh, organizations and maintaining them is, is our job. So it's not a small industry. It's not a mom and pop. For people who don't live in areas where this is a big thing, it is very likely coming to you. The uh, country is now understanding that with that much investment in real estate and services, they've got to be regulated. In Florida, it's heavily regulated. You have to have a, a, a license in order to do this if you're doing it for money. 40, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the communities are self-managed, and that basically means that either the board is managing them or they have hired uh, as an employee of the association, someone to manage their um, community, which requires a license, or um, they are, the board just manages it all themselves, they divvy up the labor and they uh, manage it. The only thing I would say about that is that if you would consider professional management, 
you have the benefit of having kind of an objectivity, um, a positive objectivity person in between you and your neighbor. So if you're the one who's always doing the violations and you have to stay abreast of all of the statutes and you have to make sure that you are doing things legally and you are, if you're managing, you have to follow the statutes as well as anyone else, that you would consider professional management to, uh, at a minimum, consult to make sure you're doing things properly, right? So let's have some fun. Often when community managers get together, we talk about the industry, of course. So we'll sit around and we are at dinner. And we'll say, man, we don't understand why, and this is the first one we're going to talk about, why owners don't read their documents. Well, one, they're dry and boring. Two, the language is often um, in legalese. And three, I suspect that just like a lot of people, we don't read the small print that comes with our curling iron or our television or our computer desk. We just kind of try to put it together ourselves and we don't necessarily read the fine print. Uh, or, or maybe it's just me. But I would say that is kind of human nature and it's not inconsistent with every other thing someone has to read. So rather than just complaining about it, what can we do to encourage them to read their documents? And I'm, I'm coloring outside the line, so if you want to call in and, and add to what I'm talking about, please feel free. But obvi, I can continue speaking for half an hour with no problem. So what if we had a game like Jeopardy? where we had an Alex kind of person, and then we had um, categories where you had sort of a game night where people could get involved and in understand their documents. So you would say, um, I don't know. Mm, uh, the, the, the topic would be, sorry, this is radio. Um, the topic would be, uh, trash. And then one of the questions would, the answers would be, um, not before 8.30 in the morning. And the question is, when can you put your trash out? It is things like that. Whether or not you leave your garage door, can leave your garage door open? Can you use a grill that has charcoal? Or is it just gas? Or is it just electric? And in one community, uh, it is one way. In another community, it's another way. You can't there are some communities, their rules say you can't back into a parking space. I don't know why, that's the rule. This is on my mind because we're actually talking about rules in a couple of the communities we manage. And I want to encourage board members when you are making rules that they need to meet three criteria. They need to be reasonable so that a reasonable person can understand and follow it. It needs to be enforceable so that you can't have a rule that um, there are no yellow polka dot bikinis um, allowed at the pool. How does the manager enforce that? That's impossible. So they need to be reasonable. They need to be enforceable. And the last one is they, they need to not contradict the document. So I don't want to get in the weeds, but you, they have to be reasonable rules. So when you're thinking, Think about how your manager or you're going to enforce those rules or then just don't make it a rule because then you're just going to make everybody angry. But let's think outside the box. So uh, Jeopardy, we can have a Jeopardy game night and have whomever wants to attend participate. And I would say if you bring food and beverages, you'll have a probably have a better um, chance of getting them there. Or we could do, uh, how about like a family feud game, right? Now, this is probably going to be more appropriate in communities where there are large auditoriums, where they already have a social structure. But you could do this at uh, the pool in, I don't know, once a quarter at a smaller community. Why not? So you have this family feud type game, which means that you're going to have to create something, which is congratulations, managers, you have another job. Now, here's something that I thought of, and my staff is uh, constantly kind of rolling their eyes at me about things that I come up with. But how about a bingo game? How about a, <clears throat> bingo's huge in Florida. 
in case you didn't know, pardon me for clearing my throat. It's big in Florida, and if we had a bingo game where you had different, oh, topics that you discussed where by accident people would actually learn their rules or learn what their documents say, I think it could work. There are so many other ideas that I know that you can think of. What I'm trying to do is not continue blaming owners for not reading their documents because the truth is even some board members don't necessarily know the contents of their documents and the managers have to refer to them when they are, are looking to enforce a rule. But if we can incentivize people in some way to get involved with their documents because we have a shared responsibility, right? If we can make it interesting and fun for them, could they, by default, learn something? I think the answer is yes, and I would be super interested in what you think about that. The other area of, uh, I don't know, minor irritation that community managers have is poorly attended board meetings. I had a couple of meetings this week where nobody showed up. Nobody showed up. It's, it was me and the board, and of course, um, things get done. But nobody knows about it because no one attends the meeting. Then we'll get some questions later about, well, when did this happen? Um, why are we doing this? And you want to say, well, it happened at the board meeting. And we posted the notice and nobody showed up. But again, there's got to be a reason why that's not happening. Now, there, in some communities, there are the same people who have an interest and show up at the board meetings. There are the same kind of people that show up at city council meetings. There's a certain percentage of the population that are just engaged. In Florida, a lot of those people are snowbirds and they've gone to their, uh, you know, their summer residences. And so we have a, a diminished population and a lot of those people are gone. But the people who are still around, why would you not want to know what your board members are planning for your community. So invariably, something they're planning has a cost associated with it. It is uh, likely going to impact your the look um, of your community or the process by which you park your car, the, the flowers that are installed, the signage that's installed that you didn't know about, and then you come to the office and wonder how it happened. How can we make it fun? So if we color outside the lines again, let's say, hmm, for board meetings, we could have a raffle. And we could raffle off something that was donated by, um, I don't know, by an owner, maybe by a vendor. Don't. I, the, the legal folks are probably losing their mind right now. This is not authorized by anybody. And of course, you have to check your documents. But I'm trying to spur some ideas about how we get people engaged. And food is a powerful motivator. And so is stuff. So if you could have a, a raffle where people who attended 12 board meetings in a year get entered into a grand prize of how about a golf cart, if you live in a golf community, or if you live in a tennis community, a six months of lessons and a whole new outfit to get just decked out. Um, one of the things I discussed with the staff today is they were like, well, if you attend three meetings, you go into a raffle for VIP parking that's right in front of the clubhouse or uh, right in front of your property. Or do you see where I'm going? Do you see what I, I'm trying to figure out how we stop complaining only and start thinking of ideas that we can partner with owners to get them involved in attending their meetings. Are they the most exciting things in the world? Heavens no, not even close. But real decisions get made that affect uh, how much money you have to pay the association on a monthly or quarterly basis, what color your building is going to be, as I mentioned, what color your flowers are going to be, whether or not trees are removed, uh, whether a, a 
a large expenditure for a half a million dollar roof project. All of these things happen at board meetings that use the money that you contribute to your association on a monthly or quarterly basis. So it seems to me that even if that was the thing that got them in the door, again, by default, they would actually learn something. The other reason I want people to attend meetings is for accountability. People who attend meetings ask questions. Board members certainly ask questions of the manager, and that is an appropriate thing to do. But when owners attend the meeting, they can hear the conversation between the board member and the manager and the board members uh, amongst themselves about what the association is planning. And they can uh, typically, before a meeting, raise their hand and say, I disagree with this. Or after the meeting, if there is a, um, an appropriate time and every board meeting is different, say, you know what, I, I didn't agree with any of that. And here's why. Now we have a real give and take of understanding what interest owners, what concerns them. Maybe we weren't looking at, looking at it from their perspective. A lot of times, particularly in Florida, we have uh, elderly and infirm owners. And it's always p uh, front of my mind to think of how we accommodate them when we're planning a project. But if you manage an all-age community, as I've written in one of my blogs, then uh, can you have the really noisy work after nap time for young moms? Can you have it uh, maybe while the kids are in school or going off to school? If you are planning something for the holidays, as many people do, their lifestyle directors do, can you include those uh, families and children and grandchildren that come for seasons. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's important to remember that this is about people. So for me, when we're planning those projects in those board meetings, it's helpful to have the input from uh, from the owner. So I would encourage uh, community managers to th you know think outside the lines. I don't know how feasible any of these things are. But I know it's really easy to complain and much harder to find solutions to get people to uh, attend these meetings. The third issue that uh, community managers, property managers, if you will, complain about is not reading the notices. So we spend a great deal of time preparing notices for I don't know, a fire drill, um, fire alarm testing, seal coating coming up, a painting project, a roof project, which is literally going to stop you from going into a garage the way you normally go and reroute you in a different way. And the morning it starts happening, it is, it's very frustrating for people who don't know about it. So I'm interested in hearing what devices other managers use. Now, I'll share with you what we use. So, uh, board meeting minutes and financials are put on the internet. If you can log on to the intranet, I should say, and take a look. You know what happened the month before at the board meeting if you choose not to attend, but it's all there. We post, hey, attention, the pool is getting cleaned. There's algae in the pool. We've got to shock the pool. You're going to turn purple if you get in there. Stay away. Mm -hmm important to read, and everything in between. But they're not read, the emails are not opened, and yet there's a frustration with the owners when they are not aware that something is going on. And um, is, that, is that a shared responsibility or is that something that solely the manager's responsibility or the board's responsibility? I submit that it is a shared responsibility. It's our job to make sure you have the information after the board has approved it. And then it's your job to actually read the bulletins and then pay attention. And I'm speaking to owners and uh, tenants. It's your job to read and uh, respond. That cuts down on a lot of frustration, um, confusion, unhappiness, frankly, which we all want to avoid. 
So if we think about how we can think differently, I'm going to start out, out, out of the box again, how we can think differently about how to communicate with people. Now, uh, recently in one of the communities, we installed a somewhat unattractive stop here at the gate sign because with uh, a lot of deliveries, food, Uber, they need to understand they've got to stop at the gate. So it showed up, they were mad, it could have been avoided. Think differently, color outside the lines, find out what is going to help people to attend meetings, read their documents, and read communiques. I'd be very interested in hearing about it. You can contact me online at hellotonoa.com, on Twitter at hellotonoa. Thank you so much for listening. It's always my, it's so much fun, and it's a huge privilege. I'll see you here next week. Again, it's just you and me having community conversations on Fridays. And in August, we'll invite some friends in. But I hope you feel my passion. I hope you've learned a little something today. And it's been my honor to spend time with you. Thanks. You have been listening to Community Conversations with Tanoa Lynn Poyer. It is my honor to host this program, and I appreciate you listening. We have an exciting show planned for you next week, so mark your calendars and join me every Friday at 5 p.m. on WNN 95.3 FM and 1470 AM. We look forward to hearing from you, our listeners. It's all about learning, sharing, and teaching. We're all in this together. Until next time, be a blessing to someone and endeavor to persevere. The opinions of-